Okay. Oh, you Turn took off. my seat. Yo. Can I sit here? Sure, yeah, of course. Um, thank you. Yes. Let me... What's up, Brian? All right. Just mm -hmm. a, no, it's great. All right, let's get going, everyone. <clears throat> okay. All right, well, let's get started because uh, our time is going to fly by and you're going to want more. That's a guarantee because uh, this is a very uh, special class we have today with Tom Tierney, who I'm about to introduce. I just wanted to say a couple things about where we are, where, uh, where we're going. Um, two weeks from today is our last class. I know. It's kind of sad. Kind of happy. Uh, <coughs> And, uh, and on that class, we are going to be, you're, you're going to be teaching each other, really. So you'll have written the final paper, which you have, if you haven't started writing that or even thinking about it, now is a really good time to be reading the assignment for the final paper and taking notes, <coughs> using the feedback sessions with your team to uh, draw information from that that you can use in the final, because the final paper is, in essence, Looking back, reflecting on the year, what did I learn about myself as a leader and as a team player? Especially in light of the goal that I had for what I wanted to focus on this year. And then looking forward, how do I use what I learned here to continue to grow as a leader in the next phases of my development? And so we'll ask and, and get as many of you as possible to stand right here and give us the, the one minute version of that uh, two weeks from today. So uh, the, the final then and the, the 360 process, they kind of go together. As you're reflecting back, it's not just about what we've done in this class or the readings or the lectures. Uh, for It's the whole year and all of your experiences this year. So it's an opportunity for you to reflect and to learn and to use that as you think about the next phases. Uh, next week, we are going to... Uh, explore the case of Carlos Ghosn. <clears throat> this is a case of a leader at the top of an organization driving a large-scale organizational change. And you'll read a short, very useful piece from John Cotter's work on how you lead large-scale organizational change, and then we'll apply that to the case of Ghosn when he took over Nissan. So there's some, re some um, questions for you to address. Be prepared to talk about them in our class session next week. So change is the order of the day. We'll, we'll, we'll look at what a leader does at the top of an organization to lead large-scale change, and then we'll come back and kind of come full circle to look at the process of change in terms of your own growth and development as leaders. And to, uh, to inform that, uh, we have with us this morning Tom Tierney. Uh, you have had a chance to read the reflections on his uh, life and career that, that, that came out of uh, uh, his talks at Harvard Business School. So I'm not going to recap all of that, although some of that will come back into his conversation with you. Um, and you've also had a chance to look at his bio. So just very, very quickly, Tom is a really good friend of this course. Uh, I'm very proud and uh, uh, honored, really, to count him as a friend of mine personally. Uh, and he has been contributing by uh, his time to this course over many, many years. Uh, and you'll see that he's very conscious and deliberate about how he spends his time. So we're, we're really very fortunate to have him with us today. Uh, he is a, now a recognized leader uh, in serving the nonprofit sector. In 1999, as you know, he co-founded the Bridgespan Group, which is an independent nonprofit organization designed to provide uh, general management consulting services to foundations and other nonprofits. It's expanding. It's, it's, it's bigger now than that, even, uh, when this was written just a few months ago. Uh, during, so during 2000, he stepped down as the CEO of Bain & Company to start what he would refer to as this little charity. Why did he do that is a question some of you are probably asking. That's a good question. And I expect that he will address it. And if he doesn't, you should ask him. Uh, <clears throat> he recently led the development of BridgeStar, which is a, an initiative of BridgeSpan uh, dedicated to enhancing and increasing leadership talent in the nonprofit sector. So he 
talks, teaches when he can, but he doesn't <coughs> do it enough, I think. He should do more. He's also been profiled in a number of different places, including um, uh, learning from the CEO, finishing well, two really useful uh, volumes. He's also co-authored a very popular book on organization and strategy in the professional services arena called Aligning the Stars that he published uh, in 2002 with uh, Harvard Business School Press. Joined Bain in 1980 following uh, graduation from HBS where he got his MBA with distinction. Uh, he was promoted to partner after three years. That was probably still probably a record in terms of the speed of ascent uh, and served as a managing director at Bain San Francisco office in uh, uh, soon after. In 1992 he became CEO and grew the firm uh, in, in, in every dimension that, that really matters. He's from California. He, his first job was in, uh, well, driving bu a bus, right? You drove a bus as your first job. Uh, and then he ended up in Algiers. Hopefully he'll get a chance to talk with you about that. He's also a director of eBay uh, and serves on and has served on many, many nonprofit boards. I'm not going to go into the list because it's too long. When I asked you a couple of weeks ago for uh, a suggestion for someone who I could interview or profile for my next book, which is about leaders who are successful in all the different parts of life and in bringing them together, uh, Tom's the model for that. He is at the very top of my list. So I'm really thrilled to have you back here in our class again. Please welcome Tom Tierney. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. I think Stu has a short list uh, because it doesn't feel to me like I'm on the top of anything. Uh, we're going to start with a few questions. I'm going to ask you all a question, and I'd like quick responses, sound bites, one sentence. Then I'm going to take the floor and share with you a couple of thoughts about how to succeed at, as leaders, which essentially means how to succeed in your life. It's very difficult to decouple. I think those two dimensions. And then we'll open it up for Q&A. So here's my question. How do you, in your life, define success? As you're thinking about your future, what is, for you, success? I will cold call. <laughs> Ability to have an impact. Ability to have an impact. Great. Next. Reaching Pardon me? Reaching potential. Reaching potential. Great. Good family life, okay? Achieving goals. Achieving goals. What kind of goals? Personal goals. Personal goals, great, yes. Uh, gives you a feeling of satisfaction. Satisfaction, feeling like I've done well. Being yes. Happy. Happy. Anybody want to find happy? <laughs> All right, I'm not sure about that. Yes. Um, continuing to contribute to others and also to like my own growth. Personal growth, contribution to others. Yeah. Matching your talents with the world's needs. Ah, matching my talents with the world's needs. Terrific. Yes. Challenging yourself. Pardon me? Challenging. Challenging yourself. Okay. <laughs> Anybody else? Being useful. Being useful. To? To society, to your friends, to everybody around you. Okay. Being useful. To various constituents. Yeah. Connecting to something larger than yourself. Connecting to something larger than yourself. All right. Yes. Living an exciting life like in a book. Exciting life. Adventure, fulfillment, yes. Anybody else? Bringing change. Bringing change, making things better. Presumably good change. Okay. <laughs> Let me, oh yeah, one more, okay. Did you have another? Have lots of money. Lots of money. <laughs> you know, it took at least 15 answers before anybody mentioned money. Here's the point. Pardon me? I guess it's just not that important. <laughs> well, maybe we'll touch on that. Uh, here's the point. The success is personal. The definition, to some extent, changes over time, depending on one's circumstances and dreams. And in fact, if you think about your definition of success, however you're thinking about that today or five years from now, over time, the conventional belief is my life ought to go up and to the right. So if we're thinking about that in terms of money, my net worth out here ought to be higher than my net worth out here. Hopefully a lot higher. Oh, and, and I ought to have more stuff. So no house here, house, second house. You know, think about 
your business card. My business card ought to have a better title on it out here than out here. And I ought to have more people reporting to me. I remember when this exec came to me once, and he was, I was asking him about his job, and he, said, he basically he said, I have a big shot. I have 10,000 people reporting to me. And I thought, my god, how does he talk to all of them? <laughs> That's just got to be tough. 10,000 different people that are stacked up outside his office. Think of the emails. Lots of different ways to think about success. Part of the message is, do you think about that in your way, or do you think about that in the way that other people want you to think about it? So business schools in general, business people in general, have scorecards. The scorecards are kind of easy to measure. How many people report to me? How much money do I have? What's my net worth? My stuff. Those things are a little easier to measure than, for example, self-worth. That's kind of hard to measure. So one dimension of this success thing is you have your scorecard, and your environment has its scorecard. And sometimes that, those two don't exactly overlap. There's another question around this success thing, and it, and it relates to how you think about your life. There are kind of two ways to think about it, and they're not mutually exclusive. In fact, you can toggle back and forth. One way is, if, if this chalk represents life, it's this way. It's I live my life day to day. And yeah, I'm kind of thinking about the future, but I'm, I'm taking it a day at a time. I'm 29. I'm thinking about being 29. I'm going to think about being 30. I'm going to think about the next steps. I'm going to get through first year, get a summer, uh, summer job, and the second year, get a job. And that's normal, typical, healthy, necessary. There's another way, however, to think about life that is additive to that, and that's like this. Think about life this way. Born here, die there. If I have 70 productive years, and hopefully touch wood, I've got more than that. I'm 54 right now. If I have 70 productive years, and I'm born at midnight on Sunday, then I'm dying at midnight the next Sunday, or at least becoming unproductive at midnight the next Sunday. Right now, it's early Saturday morning for me. Now, early Saturday morning sounds like kind of pretty far along in the week. <laughs> and it makes you think about life this way. It makes you think about life, what's important? All of you, you're probably around Wednesday or so in your life's week, if you believe in the 70 years. I'll tell you what, when you hit the weekend, you think differently. <laughs> and one of the implications of that is the weekend will get here sooner than you think. And how you're feeling about your life is in part a function of how you're thinking about what you want your life to be all during that time, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and so forth. The conventional wisdom again, or at least the illusion, is that life's not only are supposed to go up and to the right, but they're supposed to, it's supposed to be linear. So if you read that, I was looking back at that reflections case, which I guess you guys had to read. I'm sorry about that. Uh, it, looks like the, it looks like a linear thing. You know, he graduated. He did this. He joined Bain. Of course, at that time, Bain had 100 people, and it was a startup, essentially. But you know, it looks kind of linear. Well, life doesn't work that way. And as I thought about that in preparation for today, I said, you know, here's what really happened. Here's how life really works. Okay? I, I, I'm a kid. My dad's working in the factory at Colgate Palmolive making toothpaste. He wants me to go to college. He went to college on the GI Bill. I don't want to go to college. I want to go into the Peace Corps. So we had this big debate. I'm 18. He fills out my college application. I sign it. UC system. I end up at UC Davis. I didn't want to go. I had to pay for it. So they, my mom and dad agreed to pay for the first six months. I then went to college. I'm in UC Davis. I don't want to be at UC Davis. I'd never set foot in UC Davis until I drove up it, it, to, join, to get into the dorm that day. So I'm in the engineering program. We're now toward the back end of my first year. And I remember vividly the grades are coming out. And in particular, this was Chem 4A. So this was a course, one of these big lecture courses that had every brilliant pre-med student in the world was in this course. And in those days, I don't know how it works today, they posted the grades outside the lecture hall. And you went when they posted to look at their grades. And all the grades are there. And they're, the, the person who got the best grade is number one. There are 400 people in the class. It's a big list. And you kind of go down. And you're reading down that list. You know, it's a big crowd of people, kids. You're reading down the list. And you hit the oh shit line. 
<laughs> which is, oh shit, <laughs> I'm further down the list. And I was, I'm not sure I was at the bottom, but I was all, almost at the bottom. And I remember thinking, I don't want to be here. I, I, I don't know why I am here. This is hard. I'm not smart enough. I'm working as hard as I, I don't know how to work any harder. And I was, I was said, okay, do I drop out? And by the way, I'm, I'm working a job to pay for it. And do I drop out? And I was walking back, Davis has all these bike paths, and I'm walking down a bike path, and I hear, I hear somebody whistling, beautiful whistling. It's a blue sky day, and a beautiful whistling, just like a bird, the whistling was so pretty. And I'm at a head down, I look up, and here's this guy who's whistling, and he's in a wheelchair. He's got no legs. I thought, okay, Tom, if he can whistle, I can whistle. And I worked out of that hole. And for me, and for virtually everyone here, life is a series of holes like that, a series of, of downdrafts, where when you're in it, you feel like you're just going to collapse. You, can't, you just don't see a way out. And it was, it was interesting because as I went through it, you know, I graduated from Davis, couldn't get a job. My only job offer was Kmart. I was the training, training program of Kmart. Well, that might sound exciting to you, but it didn't sound that exciting to me. I'd been driving buses as a, as a job to pay, pay my way through school, and I kept driving buses. I like driving buses, but I'm thinking, okay, am I going to be, all my friends went off, they had other jobs, am I going to be a bus driver? Is that it? I met a guy whose dad worked at Bechtel, but two weeks later I ended up in North Africa. When he made me the job offer, he had this big globe in his, in his office, and he said, he said, Tom, um, and I don't think I would have got the job if I hadn't the introduction through my friend's dad, here, uh, you know, we've got you, we're working on this job in our zoo, Algeria. And he looked at, and I must have looked at Paul and said, you don't know where Algeria is, do you? He said, no, but I'm sure it's not in California. <laughs> Positive. Because I'd only been on a plane once, I think only once, I'd gone to Seattle. And so then I got on a plane at age 21 and a half or whatever and flew to Algiers. Completely different thing. And you know, you go through, what am I doing here? I'd said goodbye to my girlfriend, I said I'll be back two years, yeah, like, that word's going to work. So no girlfriend. I'm alone. I'm in this foreign place, 50 different nationalities, in a construction camp with 10-foot high barbed wire all around us, which I would never really figure out was to keep other people out or us in. 8,000 guys, 30 women. It wasn't exactly the great dating environment <laughs> that UC Davis was. And I'm thinking, I'm killing me. So then I go through, and I'm at two years. I'm slugging away, and I decide I'm going to go to business school. I want to go to Stanford business school because it's back where I grew up. My parents want me to come home. I apply to Stanford. They reject me. They reject me. I, and I'm sure I was the only uh, application they received from Algeria. So it wasn't as, you know, I, I thought that was the leg up. It wasn't. So now I'm, I'm back again saying, what am I going to do? And this went on and on. I end up, end up at Harvard Business School. I got really lucky. I think they, they let me in because I think they did think I was Algerian. They <laughs> sent me the... <laughs> I recall receiving the, what is it, is it TOEFL, the English exam for foreign students? I aced it. <laughs> so I think that's how I got into to that business school. I get into the business school and I, you know, I don't know, I don't know what CEO stands for. I don't know where Wall Street is, literally. I'd never been in any other state other than California that one time in Washington. All of a sudden I find myself in Cambridge. Cambridge is far stranger than Algeria. <laughs> it is not even a close call. All these people are sophisticated. They come from Wall Street. They're doing all this stuff. They know things I don't even know. I don't even, I don't have a clue. Okay, I'm wearing my Levi jacket and my, my work boots. That's the, those are the clothes I got. I'm there two weeks. This woman, this really nice woman, Betsy, takes me aside and said, people are laughing about you. I go, Pardon me? So said, well, you're wearing white socks. I was wearing dark pants and white socks. To this day, I don't get it. But <laughs> I wasn't, the fashion police were making fun of me. And, you know, I, so this was not, I thought, ah. struggled through business school. I do okay because I did have a point of view, and a point of view was important. <laughs> and I knew how to talk, and I knew how to argue, and I wasn't going to take anything from anybody after two years in North Africa. And so I, I did okay, and I learned how to take the tests and do all that stuff. I did okay. So I get this job at this little company, Bain & Company, at 100 people. I think this is like finishing school for Tom, okay? I don't have a suit, I gotta go buy a suit. I don't know how to tie a tie. My roommate ties my tie for me. Rich helped me tie the tie. He worked at GM, he knew how to wear a tie. So I go to the interview, I get the job, all of a sudden I'm at Bain. 
And I'm in the summer associate program. I do well. They make me an offer. I end up accepting. I accept because, well, this is great training for you. I'm going to stay two years and then leave. Everybody, by the way, joins consulting firms to stay two years and then leave. That's just how life works. Not everybody leaves, but that's how you think about it, at least how I was thinking about it. So I joined Bain. And I get my performance review. Now, in those days, there wasn't a big fancy performance review. It was, uh, you know, one of the senior people, in this case, one of the founders, sitting you down and saying, you know, here's where things stand. So he sits me down, and he says, well, I, and he, this is what I recall, so it's not perfect, but I've kept a lot of notes over the years, and so there's some data here. He says, well, um, I know you're in the rough. I don't know if there's a diamond. <laughs> okay, well, that sounds kind of positive. <laughs> Then he draws a circle and he puts this little thing in the center like a bullseye and he says, you're here. And the people who you work with day in and day out on projects think you're pretty good. I'm actually a really good project manager. He said, the farther you go away, the more negative it becomes. I said, hmm, okay, well, I've got some upside here, but that, at least there's some people that think I'm doing pretty well. Then he says, the clincher, in case I wasn't catching on, was Bain had hired 25 people that year. And this is not... This is not the best HR practice, okay? Bain hired 25 people. He said, we hired 25 people this year. I knew that. And we ranked them. And you are number 25. <laughs> now, the way the brain works, I thought, well, maybe they're starting from the bottom up. <laughs> they weren't starting from the bottom up. I was number 25. And all of a sudden, you have this, this downdraft where you say, ah, do I stay? Do I leave? What do I do? What's going on? And you really struggle. Then I ended up getting promoted to partner. All of a sudden, I'm running the office in San Francisco. The office has a downturn. I have to lay people off. I have to, to ask partners to leave. I remember a guy named Don. He's crying. He's got three kids, spouse, full-time spouse, full-time mom. I have to ask him to leave. Miserable. I'm thinking, ah, how can this, what am I doing here? I'm not qualified. This is terrible. Then that thing comes out of the, out of the downdraft, and all of a sudden, Bain melts down, really melts down. Got to the point where we had two years, uh, two years, two, uh, uh, two or three months of cash left. Mitt Romney comes in from Bain Capital, restructures the balance sheet. Mitt asks me to run the company. I'm in San Francisco. I try to run it from San Francisco for a year. I travel 220 nights that year. I come home. I'll never forget it was June. I walk in. I've got my bag. My wife Karen, who've been married with married married uh, married to uh, 24 years now, two great sons. She's from a small town in Kentucky, really small town, eastern Kentucky. Grew up in a you know rough kind of place, and was a journalist and a TV producer and on the air. I walk in, she says, um, something's got to change. It wasn't, hi, honey. I've been on the road for two weeks. It was, something's got to change. What do you mean? You're gone all the time. What, a five-year-old son? This isn't going to work. Something's got to change. Next thing happened, we moved to Boston. I didn't want to move to Boston. The company's in turmoil. I take over. The revenue keeps declining. Boston doesn't want to actually absorb a new CEO. It's a whole new governance structure. I don't know if I can do this job. I'm probably not the right person to do the job. My hunch is the first two or three people were smarter than me and said no. So now I'm in this, and it's just going down, down, down. I think, oh, this is unbelievable. The restructuring has eliminated what little net worth I have. And I'm in Boston. My parents are back in the Bay Area. Things start to turn up again. Finally, somewhere in the mid-90s, the firm's doing pretty well. I start thinking about public service. I've always been drawn to public service. What am I going to do? How am I going to do I, 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 I work with Jeff Braddock, professor at the Harvard Business School, who used to work with me in San Francisco at Bain. And the next thing I know, uh, we've got a business plan. We've got some funding for it. The IRS has approved it. We launched BridgeSpan. And I leave in the first quarter of 2000 to start this little charity to serve other nonprofits, to help improve the performance of nonprofit organizations, especially those organizations serving disadvantaged populations, because that's where there's a huge need and no, no real service providers. And I had two partners come into my office when that was announced, shut the door and ask, are you OK? Is your health OK? Because why would somebody leave this rapidly growing company that was now a success story? I'm in kind of the corner office. I'm making loads of money, more money than I could ever have imagined. I've, I, I've finally figured out how to do my job, so I'm actually doing it pretty well. The economy, in the first quarter of 2000, things were hot, 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 hot. I could go get these jobs at other kinds of places. I'm going to start, I got three people in a cubicle? As far as they were concerned, based on that scorecard, I had just done this. I was on a trajectory to nowhere. 
And it felt that way, and I thought, am I making another mistake? Life is a series of ups and downs. The line does not go up and to the right. The line zigzags all over the place. And if you guys haven't experienced much of that yet, you will, I guarantee it. It's just how it is. So having a bearing on how you're thinking about success for you at different phases keeps you on beam. It allows you to begin to achieve over time some of the things you want to achieve. So context for life. Now what does that mean for what you kind of do Monday morning? How do you think about developing yourself, exercising leadership, achieving your own definition of success? For the last few years, I've co-taught a, uh, it's kind of a class, it's a session at Bain New Partner Training. So every year, all the new partners at Bain, Bain now has about 4,000, 4,500 people, something like that, all around the world. And the new partners, they range from 30 to 50 people, get together for a three or four day training session. This year it's in Sonoma, California, so a nice place. It's not exactly a nonprofit type setting, but I like going there. And Harry Strachan, my co-teacher and I, uh, teach this session. The session is how to succeed at Bain and how to succeed at life. And we've been working at it for years, and Harry's much smarter than me. He's this thoughtful, brilliant guy. He was a professor, and he lives in Costa Rica, and he's done all this stuff. He's been at Bain. He's an amazing guy. So I've learned a lot from him on this stuff. So we teach this session. And what I'm going to do now is give you some of the headlines from the session. So you're going to get in 10 minutes sort of four hours of content or five hours of content. And so all this is meant to do is prompt questions for you. Einstein has this a terrific phrase that questions are more important than answers. At least he's attributed with saying that. Questions are far more important than answers. If you're not asking question about what does success mean for me now and 10 and 20 years from now, Somebody else is going to answer it for you. It's going to be answered by the circumstances you find yourself in, not by you doing what you think you need to do. So there are a few really powerful questions that if you can focus in on, you're more apt to achieve whatever your definition of success is. Question number one, bucket number one, how do I get better? How do I develop myself to get better? Now, in business, every business, every product, ought to be better a year from now than it was last year, right? Continuous improvement, learning curves, experience curves, we all know that. You all ought to be more effective at life, at achieving success, a year from now than you were five years ago. If you're not, something's wrong. You're not learning. Think about any athlete. Think about anybody. You ought to be better at success in life and at leadership that leads to success in life in the future than you have been in the past. Presumably you came here to learn stuff so that you would be more effective in the future than you have been in the past. Same concept. So how does one develop oneself? It's not